Hello. My name is Hans George Campbell. I'm out in my shop tonight. I'm going to be doing the prep work um, that I need to do in order to recap the motherboard on my Amiga 1200 computer here. Got a lot of work to do, so let's get started. Yeah, um, a little bit of history behind this computer. Uh, I bought this computer from my friend Sean. I think I paid him like $300 for this computer, which was a steal for an Amiga 1200 computer. 300 bucks for an Amiga 1200 in this nice of shape, that was, that was a really good price, you know. Uh, he told me that it does work. I haven't plugged it in yet. I don't know if it works but I'm going to take his word for it. Um, it is in really nice shape. The keyboard is a little yellowed, but um, that's okay for now because I'm planning on replacing it with one of the um, uh, the new ones with the mechanical key switches, the, um, uh, what do you call it, um, the German engineered cherry key switches. Um, I'm going to be replacing it, this keyboard, with one of those type of keyboards. And also, after I finish recapping this Amiga 1200, I'm going to put the board and keyboard and the disk drive and everything into a brand new blue case. And I've shown this case uh, on this channel. So if you have not watched that video, you know, go ahead and watch that video. I, th I think you'll, you'll enjoy it. But yeah, and I'm also going to put in um, a, a compact flash card adapter in here with a one gigabyte compact flash card to use as a hard drive. And I think this Amiga 1200 has uh, the Kickstart 3.0 ROMs. So I bought a, a, a new set of Kickstart uh, 3.1 ROMs to put in here. So I'm going to do that as well because I want to use... Uh, Amiga OS 3.9 on this computer and uh, so I need the 3.1 ROMs in order to do that. Amiga OS 3.9 looks really nice on an Amiga 1200. It really does. Yeah. It really, it, it looks really nice. Anyway, let's get started here. Um, I've got all the capacitors that I need for doing the recapping. Uh, got these are the four uh, through hole technology capacitors. Um, let me get my pointer. Um, I believe these are 470 microfarad, uh, 16 volt, and these are 1,000 microfarad, 16 volt, and they're high quality Japanese made uh, capacitors. So these are the four through hole. Uh, technology capacitors that I'll be installing on this board. Um, these are the surface mount capacitors that I will be installing. I believe these are 10 uh, microfarad 35 volts. Um, yeah, 10 microfarad 35 volts is what those are. And these are 22 microfarad, 35 volts. They're high quality. These, I believe all of these capacitors, these service mount caps, are Nichicon, so they're made in Japan. They're really good quality. And I've got these 47 microfarad capacitors right here. 
okay? And I've got these 100 microfarad. I think these are 10 volt capacitors right here. They're 10 volt. Now you notice that none of these capacitors are the solid state capacitors. Um, I do not recommend installing solid state capacitors on an Amiga 1200 motherboard. You want to go back with the same type of capacitors that Commodore originally used. And I don't know if you noticed or not, but this is a Commodore made Amiga 1200 computer. These are much better quality than the ones that came out later on. I think, um, well, it's a third party company, a company that bought out the rights to the Amiga. They started also producing the Amiga 1200. Well, they lowered the quality on those. But the Amiga 1200s that are made by Commodore, these are the ones that you want. These are the better made Amiga 1200s. They even have a much nicer, much higher quality disk drive, which I will be showing you. So, when I come back, um, I'll start disassembling this computer. All right, first thing we want to do, we want to very carefully, um, I don't really like putting it on its keyboard, but this is a pretty soft mat. I mean, it's an anti-static mat, so yeah. Okay. Again, because we've got uh, metal screws that are going into a plastic case, you want to use a low torque screwdriver like this one. These are made in Germany, and this is what you want to use. You do not want to use a full size screwdriver like this one. They have way too much torque, they're too heavy and you will strip out the threads, the plastic threads. And you definitely don't want to use, I, I've seen a lot of you use the type of screwdriver that it's a big bulky handle and it's got all these tips that you plug in. If you have a screwdriver kit like that, take that thing right now, pause the video, take that, that screwdriver kit right now and throw it in the garbage. Yes, you heard me right, throw that piece of crap in the garbage, okay? Invest in a good set of screwdrivers like this. These are really nice screwdrivers. They're more expensive than your average screwdriver, but you get what you pay for. If you take care of the, these screwdrivers, they will last you the rest of your life. And this is the type of screwdriver that you want to use when you're working on vintage computers like the Amiga 1200, where you have metal screws going into a plastic case, okay? So, the first screw I usually take out is this one. Okay. I'll put it right there. Oh, it's got one over here too. I didn't. I didn't know that. It's got one over here. Yeah. Well. Yeah, this one's been open already. I can tell. I have never opened up this computer. So this is the first time me looking inside it. First time me opening this one up. Uh, 
some reason it won't come out. I might as well go ahead and take out these screws too for the disk drive because I will be taking that out. Okay, let's pull those out. Now these I think are different. The two screws for the disk drive, these are machine screws. They're machine screws. I think they're 2.5 or 3 millimeter. So you keep those separate from your case screws because they are not the same. Okay, they're not the same. Okay. I don't think this computer has an expansion board, so I don't have to worry about that. Um, put that there, put that there. Okay, so I'll make sure it's underneath the camera before I open it up. And uh, yeah, let's go ahead and do this. Now, you got to be careful when he takes this part because you got clips um, over here on the case that can be easily broken. So you want to be, you know, be careful with that. And I'm thinking that let me move my soldering iron up a little bit closer where I can rest this like that. Okay, and then the keyboard, um, it's kind of hard to reach in there. Okay. Okay. And the keyboard just comes out like that, so... Okay, it appears this Amiga 1200 might already have... Okay, it's got Kickstart version 4.68. I think those are 4... four uh, yeah. I think those are version 3.1 ROMs. I think they are. But I'm still going to go ahead and replace them. Put brand new ones in there. Um... Wow. Okay. Apparently, okay. Um, this computer has been upgraded because these usually come with either a... Okay, the early Mi 1200s came with 40 megabyte IDE laptop hard drives. And the later ones uh, came out with 50 megabyte IDE laptop hard drives. But this one here is a Toshiba, which is very high quality. It's an 810 megabyte hard drive. Hmm. That's nice, actually. Yeah. I like that. Okay, so the LEDs, according to what I'm seeing here, um... The LEDs plug into the front part, the front connector, okay, and the disk drive plugs into the rear one, okay, and I just unplugged it like that. The green wire goes toward the drive, the black wire goes toward, uh, toward the hard drive. Okay, green wire goes toward the disk drive. All right, so now I can put the top piece over here, like that. All right, let's go ahead and unplug the disk drive. Okay, also the disk drive, it appears to have like a keyed connector right here. Okay, so it only plugs in one way. 
case any of you want to do the same thing, you know how this thing um, comes apart. And, okay. I don't want to take a chance on scratching up that the bottom of that circuit board, so I'll hold on to it. Appears to have a Panasonic drive. I don't think this was the original drive. Because the original drives that came out of these Commodore um, Amiga 1200s, they were the high quality shit on drives. I mean, they're really good ones. Yeah, these, these Panasonics, I think, are what was installed in the later uh, third party Amiga 1200s. Not the ones by Commodore. So this is a replacement drive. I can already see that. I'm still going to clean it up and make sure it works. I mean, Panasonic does make good stuff. They're made in Japan. So they are good stuff. Wait a minute. It's assembled in the Philippines. See, yeah, this is a lower quality drive. Because the shit on that was in here, which I'll probably go back with, was made in Japan. They're very high quality. Very high quality drives. In fact, what I'm thinking about doing with this Amiga 1200 is I have two of those Shinon drives, those, uh, those high-quality ones, but they're high-density, and they are Amiga drives because I took them out of a couple of Amiga 4000 computers that I have and uh, as, you know, to keep as spares. And so I'm thinking that I might want to put one of those drives in here because they'll fit in here with no problem. And then I'll have high density capability on this Amiga 1200. I'll be able to read and write Amiga 1.76 megabyte disks as well as the standard 880K disks. Okay, because Workbench 3.1 and of course Amiga OS 3.9 they support high density uh, drives and high density disks. So yeah, I think I'll do that. All right. So let's take the hard drive out. Um, I need to get that cable out of there. Wow, unplugged pretty easy. <laughs> unplugged pretty. Now, this one is a different type. This one's a different type than the other one that I have. Yeah, this is a different type because the other one, this part sticks out, this part edge rider sticks out a little bit further and then it goes in where the cable comes out. And I noticed that because when I plugged in my compact flash card adapter that I've also shown on, on this channel, um, it ships it over a little bit this way, the cable ships over this way a little bit and it rubs on that piece of metal that comes out. So I have to file that down so that there's no chance of it cutting into the ribbon cable. But with this one, I may not have to do that. I just got to redrill the holes, you know, to fit standard laptop drives, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. That will work out pretty good. Okay. So there's the hard drive. All right, when I come back after a quick commercial break, I'll actually pull the motherboard out and I'll show you how to safely remove the shield without breaking these tabs. So I'll, I will be back after a quick commercial break. Excuse me, sir. How do you spell relief? Well, whenever I suffer from excessive gas in my bowels, I spell relief F-A-R-T. F-A-R-T. Fart spells relief. Okay, I'm back. <clears throat> um, looks like somebody forgot to put in a screw right here. It's missing. Go 
it also hmm they forgot to put in a screw here to hold that part of the drive in I hate when people they do a crappy job I think I have some spare screws like that, so, yeah. Okay, so this is now, I'm able to pull this board out. And there is the case. It doesn't appear to be anything broken on it or anything like that. A good thing to do um, on these cases right here is this part right here if you're going to be using like installing an 030 board you know into your Amiga 1200 it's good to pop this thing off in fact I'm probably gonna do it and then do a nice job mark where you're gonna drill the holes and just drill some holes in here just to let some you know be able to have give some some way for the heat to escape just take a drill press not a hand drill you want to take a drill press that's uh, set for very slow speed so you don't melt this plastic. And you mark evenly with, with a ruler, you know, so it looks nice. And they don't have to be very close together, okay? And then you just take your drill press and you drill it like that. Just just some holes in there to let, let the heat escape, you know. Yeah. Okay, now the way you bend the, these tabs, okay, some stupid person that worked on this before, they didn't bend these tabs down. They're stupid. They did a half assed job. I hate people that are lazy and stupid. And I had to work with people like that when I worked in the electronics industry for 25 years. But these are called duckbill pliers or flat pliers and this is what you need or what you want for dealing with those tabs. It bends up and you can straighten those flat. Okay, like that. Same thing with this one. Just like that. Okay, and I think there's another one over here. See, they didn't bend these three. They didn't bend down. Whoever worked on this before, real stupid, lazy person. I'm telling you, I wouldn't want them working on my computer. No, they would not be working on my computer. I'm on out of there. Oh, there's another tab here. Okay. Do a good job, Mr. Campbell. Ah. Uh -huh. Do a good job, Mr. Campbell. Okay. I think this should come out now. Oh, it's got a tab. Oh, man, how many tabs has this thing got? Wow. Okay, pull that out. Pull that up off of there. All righty, make sure there's no tabs here. Now, a good thing to do is to wipe this down with WD-40. WD-40 on a, on a clean cotton rag, it conditions metal. It cleans the metal really well. And... Um, it also repels moisture. And then after, you know, you wipe it down and then clean it with, with a clean cloth. But just wipe down the shield to keep it from rusting. And then take like uh, some machine oil, a light machine oil, and squirt it on a, um, a cotton rag. And then wipe over with that machine oil on both sides to keep this thing from rusting. You just want a, a nice thin coat. Not, you know, don't go overboard with that machine oil. Yeah.
I usually use like a real light oil um, like this one. This is LaBelle 108 oil. It's a lightweight machine oil. It's just perfect for that. Just squirt a few drops on a rag, like I see five, to, no more than ten drops on a rag. And then just go in a circular motion, just wipe that down really good. And then after you're done, you take a clean cut rag and dry it off. You just want to put a real thin coat of oil, of this oil, on that metal to keep it from rusting. Okay. So, when I come back, I will continue removing the shield, and I'll zoom in onto the motherboard and talk about what I've got to do as far as recapping this, uh, this Amiga 1200 motherboard. So, I will be back shortly. Okay, so in order to get this motherboard off, well, the shield off the motherboard, um, I need to use a tool that I bought way back in the early 80s. It's a special driver that's designed for removing these bolts from these connectors here. And you're not going to believe how much this tool costs me back in the early 80s. I think if I remember correctly, I paid about $135 for this. Yes, you heard that right. This was considered back then a specialized tool. And if you wanted to get one of these, you had to pay the price. And I needed one of these because I was always working on vintage computers, even back then. I was servicing and repairing a lot of Commodore 64s and Atari STs and Amiga computers and Macintosh computers and Atari 8-bit computers and even Tandy computers and Coco computers and, and Texas Instruments computers. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So, I'll move this like this. And this thing fits the head of these perfectly. And it makes it real easy to take these out. It pays to invest in the proper tools. Tools are an investment. They are an investment. And if you take care of them, they'll last you the rest of your life. And I take good care of my tools. I mean, I've, had, I've had this tool since, I think, I think I bought this tool in 1981. And it's still in good shape today. Still in good shape today. 1981 is when I bought this tool. Paid $135 for it. That's right. 135 bucks. That's what I paid for this tool. Yep. Now I'm placing these on my workbench in the exact order that they're coming out the back of this. You want to make sure you put them right back where they, where they came from. Or else you will wind up stripping them out. Trust me, I've, I've done this for a long time. You do not want to get them mixed up like, like in a little bowl or something like that. And then think they're all the same. They're not. They're not the same. Not the same. Even on these two connectors here, they're different. They're different.
Okay. Goes real quick with the right tool, and it's really easy with the proper tool. Goes real quick and easy, boys and girls. Real quick and easy. With the proper tool. Yep. Real quick and easy. Okay, so Yeah. Okay. Well, I got that done. So let me turn this around like that. And let me pull. I don't like touching that. The fingers on that. And we'll pull this straight out. Yeah, the bottom shield appears to be in really nice shape. It's got this plastic piece on it. It's like Mylar plastic. And that back part's not bad, but underneath the fingerprints, see where all those fingerprints are? That will cause this to start rusting. So you want to take, the first thing you want to do is you want to take WD-40, uh, WD spray it on, on a cloth, you know, like a cotton rag, and wipe it down. You want to condition this metal. And it gets rid of all those fingerprints and everything. And the moisture that might be in the metal. Then you take that light machine oil, that light oil that I showed you, that LaBelle oil, sprinkle five to ten drops on a, on a clean cotton rag, and you want to wipe this all down with that oil. Every part of this, even, even the other side, both sides, and the back part especially. And you take a clean cotton rag, and you wipe it off again. to put like a real thin coat of that, that LaBelle oil on this metal. And that should help keep it in really good condition, keep it from rusting, okay? Now, um, I'll be back shortly. Okay. Okay, these tabs here, okay, you, the way you can bend them straight, you take your duckbill pliers, and you go just like that. It'll bend them nice and flat and even with the rest of this. That's how you want them. Want them nice and flat. Like that. Just like that. See, how, see what I'm doing here? Nice and flat. Okay, so that when you get ready to put the top shield back on, it'll slide over those tabs with ease, no problem. No problem at all, boys and girls. Just like that. Okay. So, 
those are in good shape again. I just need to wipe it down, like I said, with the WD-40 and then with the LaBella machine oil, and then that would be ready to put the motherboard back in and put it back in the case. Okay. I want to talk about a problem that most of you are having um, unsoldering and soldering on the new parts. These particular service mount capacitors right here. Um, because of this plastic keyboard connector right here. A lot of you wind up melting this and then you have to unsolder this, buy a new one and solder a new one on. Well, this is uh, what I recommend that you do to make unsoldering those caps and soldering on the new ones a lot easier. Um, these audio connectors right here, they're through hole parts. So you can very easily unsolder these parts. Okay? And then you put Kapton tape high temperature Kapton tape around this connector right here so that you don't accidentally burn it if you happen to touch it with the iron because this capacitor especially is very close it's almost right up against this so I understand if you accidentally touch this with your iron even with my skill I would probably wind up touching this this plastic so to keep you know, to keep from burning this plastic keyboard connector, wrap it with Kapton tape. And by doing that and removing these audio connectors here, it'll make it a lot easier to get to these parts. Okay? Um... This here is Kapton tape, and you can buy a roll like this on eBay for under $10. And I highly recommend that you get, you know, Kapton tape. Um, this is the type of tape that we used in the electronics industry. We did not use electrical tape. The black electrical tape, no, we didn't use that. This is what we used, and this is high temperature tape. Now, I have it here in my shop in two different sizes. Uh, I think one is half inch, the other one's one inch, Kapton tape. So, yeah, these are the two sizes that I use. And so, by taking Kapton tape and wrapping it around that plastic part right there, that will help keep you from melting that connector. And then since you got to unsolder these these two parts anyway, you might as well solder on brand new parts. And you can get those on eBay as well. Um, I have them right here. I have brand new parts. Um, right here. I'll show them to you. But yeah, these are brand new. Okay. Now, the ones that are on the board, we have a red one and we have a white one. That's the old color standard for your right and your left audio. The modern color standard for right and left audio is red and black. So my recommendation is to replace the white one that you're taking off the board with a black one because all modern audio and audio cables are red and black, not red and white. White is the old standard for the left audio channel because this was also used for mono, for mono audio. The left channel was, was always used for mono. If you had just one signal coming out, um, they would tell you to plug it into the left channel. And that's the reason why it's white and not black. Okay, so yeah.
So, yeah, since you got to remove these parts anyway, you might as well just solder on brand new ones. You know, that's what I would do. Um, do not replace the surface mount capacitors with solid state capacitors. I know a lot of you are doing that. Don't do that. Because the solid state capacitors do not have the same characteristics as these service mount caps here. They don't have the same characteristics. So you don't want to use them. Okay. Um, anyway, that's it for this, this part of this video series. Um, in the next part, I'm going to sh uh, show the motherboard recapped. I'll show you what I did to it as far as replacing the capacitors and soldering on the new ones. I'll show you my marvelous soldering job, you know. <laughs> and then um, I'll have the metal pieces already cleaned and oiled. They'll be ready to go. And I'll, I'll clean the disk drive underneath the camera. I'll show you guys how to clean that drive. Actually, the other drive that I'm thinking about using is already pretty clean. Um, it's one of the high-density Shinon drives that came out of one of my, uh, one of my, um, or a couple of my Mi 2000, or actually that was um, 4000 computers. Um, I, I had gotten in two Amiga 4000 computers that had two high density drives in each computer, and I only needed one in there because I was using also a CD ROM drive in there. So I took the drive, the second drive out of both of those. And I thought, well, you know what? That drive is the same type of drive that is in the Amiga 1200, only they use the normal 880K one, not the high density one. But they're both basically the same drive, except one is high density. And they're both Amiga drives. So when I put the high density drive in here, um, this computer will read and write uh, 1.76 megabyte Amiga high density disks, as well as the 880K Amiga disks. So yeah, that'd be a nice, nice feature because um, Kickstart 3.1 and Amiga OS 3.9, they can handle the high density disk with no problem. You know, the high density drive, as long as you have a high density drive installed, and that's what I'm going to install in this. And then I'll put the whole motherboard into that nice blue that new blue Amiga 1200 case that I've shown. I did a video on that case and it's on, on my channel if you want to go watch it. And I'm thinking that... Let me get it. Uh, wrong place, Mr. Campbell. It's over here. Since the new case is blue, right? The new case is blue. I'm thinking about replacing these with blue LEDs. Now this is basically one long LED that ha or one long piece of plastic in each one that has, I think it's two rectangular LEDs, well, two LEDs in each of those long pieces of plastic, but I can do the same thing, let me get them, um, I can do the same thing with, I got a bunch of these, I buy these, I buy these in bulk, I can do the same thing by soldering in um, two of these side by side. I don't know if you can see that underneath the camera or not. Just make sure that the polarity is the same as the original caps because that's basically what that is. It's got two, but instead of them being separate, it's one piece of plastic that has two LEDs inside the plastic. So this will accomplish the same thing. And then if I change out the resistor, because normally on your um, green, yellow, and red LEDs, um, you can get away with using either a 330 ohm resistor or a 470 ohm resistor. That's too low for blue LEDs. The blue LEDs will, will shine very bright. 
and bright blue light is actually bad for human health. So you really need, I mean, when you're using these blue LEDs like this, or even the normal round ones like the 3 millimeters or the 5 millimeter blues, anytime you're using the blue LEDs, you really need to tone down the brightness. And so what I'll do, <coughs> I'm pretty sure that the resistors for those, um, well, the resistors might be on, on the LED board. I'm hoping that they are. But I'm going to change them out and I'll put in 1K ohm resistors. And that should tone the brightness down on these blues so that they have a nice glowing effect or a nice beautiful glow effect. And that's what I want. And, it, and these blue LEDs will look really good with that blue case. Oh yeah, it's going to look nice. See, I also have the normal 3mm round blues, and I got 5mm too. I, just, I don't know where I put them, but these, yeah, I knew where these were. But yeah. Yeah, these, did I say resistors? LEDs. 3mm LEDs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so stay tuned for the second part. It's going to be just as informative as this first part, and I think you'll enjoy it. Um, well, that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. My name is Hans George Campbell, and until next time.